sorts of problems with their, um, their development and their operations teams. And I was called in to help them with one of my colleagues. And we would go and talk to, to various people around, around the business. So we talked to developers and QAs and project managers and system engineers and all these various people. Just to kind of get an idea of what was going on before we started you know, making any drastic changes to the way the organization was. And as, as we were doing this, as we were going around the building, um, people would sort of talk to us about you know, them, how bad they felt and how they really wanted to do the right thing, but they were trapped in, in, in this system. And it, it felt very much like, a, like counseling. You know, we'd be sitting there taking notes and people would be pouring their hearts out to us over you know, the terrible things that they, they saw going on around them. Um, uh, this was a very weird feeling, and a, a lot of the sort of the coaching literature says, you know, don't get into counselling. That's not what you're doing. You're here for coaching and, and improving. Um, so we were sort of trying to use this information to then, you know, work out how the the um, how the organisation could better organise itself, how it could be better structured and better working practices and better technology to to do development and operations work. Um, and as, as we were having these discussions, it, you know, one uh, sort of overarching message came out, which was at this client and at other clients I've seen as well, most of the problems they were having in the DevOps space, in the DevOps space, uh, were non-technical. Um, there were technical issues for sure, right? There, there, there are technical problems in software everywhere. So development is hard and testing is hard and system administration is hard. But the people in, in the organization were able to do that. They were all smart people. Um, you know, the developers were good developers. They had good testers. They had um, good sysadmins who knew their, knew their domain. They knew the field. They knew the products. Um, but they still had enormous pain releasing software, supporting it. Um, they also had lots of money. So they had, um, they had the best tooling you could imagine, right? There was, there was no want for um, test tools or continuous integration platforms or anything they needed, you know, the, the company would buy. Money was no object. Um, so they had fantastic tooling, really smart, very motivated people who wanted to do the right thing. But all of these difficulties and problems that they had in just keeping their software running, um, to give you an, an idea of how bad things had got, this um, organization was running a website with 85% uptime. Okay, it was, it was pretty bad. So it kind of turned out that most of the problems that were, were happening with, with this organization, that the, that the people in it were having, most of the problems were social or psychological um, and were to do with the way that they interacted with each other and the way they, they thought and behaved. So, so we thought we'd look at, you know, where is their common ground between all of these people, right? Because they all want to do the right thing. They all want to help and work together and collaborate and produce some awesome software and release it and run it. So, so where can we get some common ground? So, so we, looked at the, um, we looked at the values of, that are sort of encouraged um, by DevOps, right? Um, these are not like a canonical list. This isn't like the rules of DevOps. These are just things that, that I have found... Uh, that, that this team had, um, and that are sort of good DevOpsy things, right? So in, in the world of DevOps, we believe in having a common purpose, right? The dev team and the ops team have the same goal, which is to get awesome software into production and running so that it can make our users happy and we can make money from them. We believe in sharing, right? Um, it's not the dev team does a load of stuff and keeps it quiet, and the ops team does a load of stuff and keeps it quiet. We, we like to talk to each other and say, hey, I've got some awesome test tools that you can use, and I've got some awesome deployment scripts that you can have, and we can you know, share these around and you know, be helpful towards each other. Right? That's, that's part of the, the point of DevOps, is that the devs help the ops, and the ops help the devs, and we all get on and, and live happily. And we believe in technical rigor, right? Um, we believe in doing the right thing technically. We're going to write good code. We're going to have good tests. We're going to you know, manage our systems well. We're going to use configuration management tools. We're not just going to bodge things in and, and, and get it done as fast as possible. We're going to do it the right way. And, um, and we believe in rich communication. Yeah? 
So it's not the dev team sits in one room for six months and writes a load of software and then throws it over an imaginary wall to the ops team who then pick it up and run it. You know, we're going to talk to each other all the time and we're going to you know, sit near each other and we're going to be friends and we're going to go out for lunch together and we'll, we'll occasionally have a beer and it'll be you know, all really nice. Now, hopefully you're looking at this and sort of going, yeah, and? Because this, like, this is not revolutionary stuff, okay? These, these sort of values are very basic, straightforward things that we teach our children, right? Maybe not technical rigor, we maybe don't teach them that one, but, but it's, it's, all, it's all like decent stuff, right? It's, it's all good things that, you know, people just want to be like, yeah? Everyone wants to be helpful, right? Who doesn't want to be thought of as a helpful person? Who doesn't want to be, you know, nice to other people? And who doesn't want to sort of communicate with them and bring them your good ideas and share and, you know, help your, your, your fellow colleagues work towards your common goal? So given everyone wants, you know, we, we all, like, you know, in this organization, we're believing in the same sort of stuff. Um, given that we all believe this stuff and we all want to be a good person, we all want to do the right thing, um, why don't we, right? But very straightforward. You, you, you want to be good, so be good. Um, and so the, the difficult part sort of that I found wasn't necessarily that people didn't want to, to, you know, be an aligned DevOps team. It wasn't that they didn't want to do good software or that they couldn't. It's that they were something in, in the system, in the way they were working, the way they'd been organized, the way they behaved was blocking this. Um, and that's what this talk is largely about. So it's not about should you do DevOps, because the answer is yes. Um, it's, it's not about is DevOps good or any of that stuff. It's about when you've, when you've decided, right, I'm going to have my devs and my operations people working closely. We're going to collaborate. We're going to do all this good stuff. All right, we've decided on that and we formed you know, maybe a single team. And you know, we all sit in our team room and there's some developers and there's some sysadmins and some QAs and some BAs. And we're all sitting together working on our project. We've decided we're going to do this and it will all be wonderful. And then you do it. And then nothing changes and it's all still broken. This is what we're, we're looking at here. So if you've tried doing some cool DevOps stuff, you know, you've read the books and you think it's awesome, you try it out, still doesn't quite work. Um, these, are, these are 10 tips for things that you might want to look at um, if you're having the same problems that you had before you drank the proverbial DevOps Kool-Aid. <laughs> Mm -hmm. What is that? In your context, what is the operation team? Like for me, if it's a validation team or it's a packaging team, like maybe your, mm -hmm. your definition for this presentation, what is the operation team? So, um, so this presentation is, is sort of an amalgam of clients that I've visited over the years. There are a couple that are very, very dysfunctional and very large that I think are particularly appropriate, so I come back to more often than others. Um, so, of an operations team is, you know, whatever it is that, um, that the developers don't do between code getting written and it being run. Yeah? So that's different in different organizations. You're right. You might have a packaging team separately. You could have a build team separately. You could have, um, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to have the monitoring team, the networking team, you know, all of these various teams. Um, and that's part of what we come on to is, you know, does it make sense to have all of these these teams? You know, is, is there just one? Um, so not not every tip um, in this list applies to every situation. Um, most of you in the room will look at some of them and say, oh, "We already do that," um, which is awesome, good. Um, many of them you'll look at and say, "We can't do that. That's not going to work for us," and that's okay too. What what this is is sort of like a a grab bag, like an amalgam of useful things, of which, some of which will be useful, you know, for your specific problems. Um, so they're, they're useful things to think about and sort of come back to. Maybe you're feeling some of the pain I illustrated, um, and these are some, some ways of getting out of that pain. So, so in, in the DevOps world, we talk about production. 
So, so it's it's the the whole life cycle from concept, sort of business analysis, stories, development, QA, staging, production, right, is is one delivery process. The DevOps part of the world is mostly concerned with the develop and put into production, but there's also some stuff that we can do up front with sort of helping drive out requirements and, and that sort of thing as well, particularly around monitoring um, and gathering metrics. So we're, we're mostly looking at the dev and operations bit, but there's a little bit of the, um, the earlier part of the chain too. So the first one, shockingly, for an Agile conference is, um, is do agile development. Um, and the reason for this is, is GIGO, right? GIGO stands for garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have good analysis, if you don't have good stories, you're not going to be writing the right software. So you could have a fantastic operations team producing beautiful servers that are always up and never down, running wonderfully crafted software that nobody ever uses. And that's a pointless and expensive place to be. You should be doing iterative development and regular deployments. Um, you know, if, you're, if your development team is only able to produce a, um, a releasable artifact every six months, there's no point in having a sort of high-tuned DevOps-aware operations team who can deal with a release every 10 minutes because you know, they'll be sitting around bored most of the time, and you'll still have the, the pain from doing big releases. Continuous integration um, precedes continuous delivery, right? So continuous delivery where we're looking at the whole end-to-end -end process, and we're able to continually push up um, useful features into production is awesome, and you know, it's, it's a great ideal to work towards. Uh, but continuous integration is like the first step, right? So you should be doing that. When you commit, you run your tests, you produce a deployable artifact. This is kind of, you know, good sort of solid agile stuff, right? You should definitely have automated testing at all of the appropriate tiers for your application. Um, and the reason I, I have all of this stuff is that um, if you don't do this, um, you've, you've got bigger fish ever. You've got bigger fish to fry, okay? The problems that exist in your development team will almost definitely be bigger than can we do regular releases, can we support what's out there, right? You'll almost definitely be fighting, is our software of high enough quality? Are we catching bugs? Are we right, doing the right thing? You know, do we, do we know what's actually in our deployable package? So um, the first tip is not, you know, it's not uh, groundbreaking. It's just saying, carry on doing this good stuff. So sitting together is, is important. There was a great presentation on Friday about sitting together and about how, a, how an organization refactored their, their room set up within their, their building so that the dev teams could sit together rather than having everyone hidden away in their own little office. Um, and this, you know, this applies to sort of operations teams and development teams as well. Um, one interesting thing, You'll, you'll forgive me if I don't have the, the citation, but there's a, a body of research that shows that the, the richness of your communication um, is mostly based on a factor of distance. So there was a study of um, US university students, and the study was to see where do people's friends come from, right? When you go to university, you're out of your hometown, you don't really know anyone, you're, you're living in like a a hall of residence, who do you make friends with, right? And it, it turned out that the, the biggest factor for who you made friends with was not your, your sex or your race or your age. It actually turned out to be who are your next door neighbors and who are their next door neighbors. That was kind of your, your circle of influence and that's where closest relationships were made, were just like the people you were near, right? Naturally, as human beings, we you know, we develop neighbors, right? There's this idea of neighborliness and being good neighbors and getting on with the people around you. And, and this is a really strong thing. So 
the, the communication is a factor of distance, right? The amount you can communicate with someone, the bonds that you build with them um, are dependent on being close, of, close to them. Now, that, obviously, that's easy to sort out in physical distance if you all sit together. If you're remote, then you have to, you know, really make efforts to shorten the, the physical distance. So, you know, things like always on Skype channels and what have you. You definitely need to make time to talk um, explicitly, um, especially if you have totally disparate dev and ops teams. You need to explicitly call out, we're going to talk to each other. Maybe we'll come to each other's stand-ups in the morning. Um, maybe we should get the ops guys involved in our planning meetings, because operations people have requirements of software, right? They need it to have logging, and they need it to have monitoring, and all of this stuff. And you bring in ops people early on, they can, you know, they can help. They can start saying, well, we, we need this stuff. And they'll, they'll be much more helpful later in the process because they know they're getting something too. If you come and say to them, here's our new release. Can we have it? By the way, it's got this cool logging stuff in that you wanted. You know, they'll grab it off you and throw it onto the servers before you've even finished speaking. Um, open channels. So... This is like the, you know, the, the big Skype screen that everyone can just sort of walk into and wave at and say hello and talk to the people in, in the other building. Um, but it's also about saying don't funnel all of your, your communication down one channel. All right? One of the things that was most disruptive about one of the, the clients I had was that the operations team and the dev team were completely separate business entities. There was no common management until you got up to the senior vice president level of an organization with hundreds of thousands of employees. So it meant if you had to get anything done, you had to go all the way up the de development management food chain, across at this senior level, then all the way back down the operations food chain. Whereas actually, the development team and the operations team had offices right next door to each other. So the open channel was you would walk out of one office into the other and say, hey guys, while the managers are off doing their thing, can we just sort this out? Yep, so those open channels, the, the back channel, right, secret IRC channels, um, mailing lists, going down to, to lunch together, that sort of stuff, really important. And it's, it's also important to, to make time for individual people. Um, one of the things that organizations traditionally do very badly that sort of Agile tries to fix a bit is it's very easy to treat people not as individuals in a corporate context. And those individual relationships are, A, more fulfilling for your life in general, uh, and B, much more effective for getting stuff done. So it's very important still to sort of take time to go and just talk to someone, have a coffee and see how they're doing, you know, building up those relationships and, you know, giving your, your people enough time to do that with each other, right? If two, if two colleagues go out for a coffee, right? I, I almost guarantee that when, when they're out, they're talking like 90% about work, right? Because that's their, their common bond. So it's really important to sort of nurture those, those relationships, let them grow, um, and to help them happen. Does that come out all right? Yeah, don't do this. Does anyone want to have a guess at what this is? All right, I'll explain, because it is an idea so eye-rollingly awful that um, I can't blame you for not immediately recognizing it. Um, this is the door to, um, to the sysadmin team's office. And this particular team were a bit annoyed with um, the number of developers who would come into their office to ask them questions and distract them. Um, so this, this thing here is an IRC terminal placed outside the room so, so that when developers came to talk to the sysadmins, they would be told to go and stand outside and type in the IRC terminal any questions that they might have. Um, don't, don't do that. That's, that's bad and wrong. So moving on. Um, Knowledge sharing, you, you really need to spread knowledge out around your dev and ops teams. Having knowledge silos is a real 
horrid anti-pattern, and it results in lots more communication overhead, um, lots more risk to your project, because only one person or a small group of people can do a specific activity, right? If you've got only Bob knows how the backups work, then when you need to do a restore, you've got to really hope that you know he's not on holiday and that he's well and that he happens to be in the office and that he's not doing something else at the time. Whereas if you have loads of people, and they all know how the backups work, or they all know how monitoring works, or they all know where the production data center is and how to connect to it, you've de-risked any work that involves that, that topic and those resources. Um, so you've really got to go out of your way to not siloize people. Um, so ways to do this. Um, one of the things we, we covered at this client was packaging, because that's kind of an interesting handover point between development and operations teams. Right? A development team has a CI server, they build some software, they test it, and then at the end, they can make a package. So in this instance, we were using RPMs, but it could be whatever. Um, and then the sysadmins would take the package, you know, put it into their YUM repositories, and then it's available to be deployed you know, wherever, in whichever data center it needs to go to. So we had, um, you know, not all the devs understood RPM. Um, so we would run special interest groups. So we'd say, you know, every couple of weeks, people who do packaging, um, we get together, sit in a room, have some coffee, talk about, you know, how do you make RPMs? How do you deal with them? What's a good version numbering scheme? What goes into the comments field? How do you build them? You know, how do you deploy them? All of this stuff, which meant that the actual packaging work didn't have to belong to, you know, the packaging expert. It was spread around all of the dev teams. But there was that level of support that meant that, you know, a developer, you know, if he was told, you know, here's your story, you're going to have to do some packaging soon. Um, he had someone to talk to. He wasn't just left in the lurch to work it out. Um, and this is a bit contentious. Um, Irrelevant learning, I, I believe quite strongly that there's no such thing as irrelevant learning, right? Learning new stuff is, is good, even if it doesn't immediately mean that you can use it. Um, just getting into the habit of reading books, talking to interesting people, learning about stuff that's, you know, outside your domain is really good, right? It's interesting. It kind of makes your life more fun. It means you're not sort of buried in a, a single topic. So you know, encourage sysadmins to come to your, your testing talks, if you're going to do some testing talks for your developers, right? If you're doing special interest groups on Puppet, say, or Chef, or system management tools, have the developers come along, right? Let them, you know, they might not need to use this stuff straight away, but it's, it's in the building, they're going to have conversations about it, one day it's going to break, um, and it's nice to have a little understanding. So, you know, encourage people to, to go and try things outside their, outside their comfort zone. And you need to work out Conway's law. Um, Conway's law is, is sort of an observed um, phenomenon whereby an organization will always produce software that, is, that resembles its organizational structure, right? So if you have um, uh, a networking team or a web design team, you'll, you'll produce you know, a totally distinct network product. You'll produce a totally distinct web designed product. Um, you know, back-end, front-end teams are very common where you have, you know, here's the back-end system, here's the front-end system, and there's nothing in between them. Um, but you can also exploit this, right? When you know that this happens, you can say, well, we're going to build this deliverable thing, right? And the deliverable thing is going to have some software, it's going to have some networking, it's going to have some databases. Um, so we'll make a team with all of these right people in, um, and then they'll deliver that one thing as a, as a distinct business unit. Um, and I, I've had customers who do that. They sit their developers right next to the, um, to the traders. It was a financial company. Developers and traders sit next to each other. Developers code. Um, you know, the, the traders run. It all moves very, very quickly because they're very tightly coupled as a business unit. But having said, don't have silos. Uh, if you do, and many people do, um, don't just get rid of them. Um, there's kind of a, a transitionary phase, right? You're going to go from delivery team, embedded operations in with your, your development teams. Um, you can't just say, right, we're no longer having a network team. Um, networking guys, go and make yourself useful somewhere else. Um, because if you do that, uh, your network will break. Um, and you, know, you, you do need to have 
time to do that work, right? There are truly some things in, in operations that are cross projects, right? The network is the usual example. Everyone goes across the network, doesn't belong to any one team, but you all have to use it. Um, so there's lots of shared infrastructure, right? The firewalls, the load balancers, the, the actual connection to the outside world. So, you know, even if you are going to bring operations people into your dev teams and they're going to sit with the dev guys and they're going to, you know, all work together, they'll still probably have some work to do outside that room. So maybe you, you do it on a, like a timeshare basis, right? If you're a dev team, you get an operations guy once a week and he comes around and helps you with, you know, whatever it is that you need doing and he pairs with you and trains you up on how to do operations stuff. So you, you have to make sure that there's enough time to get the, the shared workload done as well. So, how do you handle uh, things like people having access to production servers and all that? So, you know, that, everybody... that is an excellent question, and one of the future top tips will deal with your question. So, if I've not answered it by the end, um, ask me again. Um, but you still want to reduce the amount of siloed work. There, there will always be common shared things, but you want to take, the, take those common shared things and make them specific to, to delivery projects as much as you can. So the, the shared infrastructure for your development teams is as pure to infrastructure as it can be. There shouldn't be anything interesting in there. Which means then you shouldn't need to have big central services teams. That doesn't mean that there, there won't be someone, right? It doesn't mean that there isn't the networking you know, people and they understand the network. They, that they'll still need to exist, right? Because networks are complicated. Um, but you should make sure that there's enough networking knowledge embedded in each of your delivery teams so that that centralized function is quite small, is quite compact. And their job is mostly to do with training up the other network engineers who are around your dev teams and your developers rather than fixing stuff themselves. You know, they'll have to fix the really nasty stuff, but um, you know, the, the centralized function team should be very light and they should be providing services into delivery teams rather than the, the usual anti-pattern, which is, oh, you want to use our network. Well, here are the requirements, right? You're not allowed to use these ports. You're not allowed to use these transport protocols, right? Which is horrid. So you, going down that path is, is just grim. So keep those teams small and light and sort of focused on helping, helping developers. <coughs> Excuse me. So a little bit about some organizational structure. This was a huge pain for, for one of my clients. I said the development team and the operations team were totally different business units. Um, and it was, it was really damaging to have that. So, so the whole team, you know, like the whole delivery unit, needs to have similar reporting. It doesn't necessarily mean you all have to have the same boss, you all have to go through the same processes, but it needs to be similar enough that, um, that you can understand each other and that your motivations are the same. Right? In this organization, the, the developers were given bonuses. They were literally given bonuses that were based on the features that they delivered. Right? And that's fairly sane. Right? You'd expect that, give developers bonuses for delivering features. The operations guys were given bonuses based on the stability of the site. Right? So these guys want to change as much stuff as they can to earn bonuses. <laughs> These guys want nothing to change at all, so they get their bonuses, right? And this is really horrid, okay? And they've got totally separate bosses, and their bosses get even bigger bonuses based on not having as many changes, right? So these whole organizations, hundreds of people, were set up at the outset to fight each other over, are we going to release or are we going to wait? Um, so you need to have similar reporting so that you understand each other and that, you know, your boss is your colleague's boss, and you know, if you disagree with something, you can have a conversation that makes sense. You're not totally set up to fail from the outset. And you need to set yourself up so that so that you don't have to go up those those you know all that way up the management chain because it's just inefficient, right? One thing that um, people grossly underestimate in our industry is the cost of communicating. It's actually quite expensive, right, to call someone and have a conversation with them, then they call someone else and have a conversation with them, and then they call someone else and have a conversation with them. And by the time you've gone up a certain number of levels of management, the problem is now being described in a totally different way, 
um, and has totally different impacts and you know who knows what's going on it's quite expensive so every time you have to go you know in, go indirectly to someone rather than just to the person who can help you and say let's talk about getting a release done and say that has a cost um, and similarly handoffs gates checkpoints this sort of thing these all have a cost as well so it's not uncommon for the operations team or the QA team to be like the gatekeepers, right? So your dev team is going to do some work, they produce their deployable package, they take it to the operations team and say, please deploy this. And the operations team go, ah, right, okay. Please fill in a change request form in order to be allowed to deploy your package into the production infrastructure. Here is our change request form. All right. I worked in an organization and their change request form spreadsheet that had 11 tabs okay it was a phone book that you had to fill in and that was the standard change like anything you wanted to change in the production infrastructure 11 tab Excel spreadsheet right fix a typo massive spreadsheet release a whole new data center massive spreadsheet and going through that process basically you know it made the developers unnecessary work and it gave the operations guys a false sense of security Right, they believed that by going through this big handoff process where they say, well, describe your testing. You know, tell us what you will do in order to back it out if it doesn't work. It was pointless, right? Because it, it, was, just, it was just paperwork. If you, you know, all, all that a large pile of paperwork proves is that you've written a large pile of paperwork. It doesn't actually prove that the software is well tested. It just says, yeah, we think it's all right. Um, we've done the usual testing. Um, and if it breaks then you'll have to fix it. Having a big pile of paperwork saying, if it breaks, we'll fix it, doesn't help you. So these handoffs become sort of um, a way for, for operations teams or QA teams or whoever is holding the gate to you know, try and push risk out of their team further down the chain. So they've got this massive document they can beat you with if anything went wrong. So reducing that is really useful, right? Um, so one thing that we did was just say, we're not gonna do that anymore. Um, the change request process is now a little web form um, and you put in the dates of what your change is and a short description of what it is and hit go. And then the, the operations team manager will look at it and say, yeah, that seems sensible. I trust you. Go and do it. And the main reason that we have that at all is just to stop two people changing the same thing at the same time. Because, you know, you only want to change at a time so when it breaks you're pretty confident you know what it was that caused the breakage. So reducing those, those handoffs is really important. And um, there's an exercise called value stream mapping, which is a, a lean thing, um, which is very useful for, for helping work out actually what your management structure should look like uh, and where your handoffs should be. Um, and this works by you know, looking at the whole, the whole stream from concept to production and saying, well, in this, in this stream, where are we adding value and where are we just waiting? Or where are we not adding value? And adding up those periods of not adding value, and then you can work on other ways of trying to reduce them. But value stream mapping will tell you, where are you being productive, right? Testing is good. So when you're testing something, you're adding value to it. You're, you're improving the quality of it. But filling in a document to say it's been tested doesn't actually make it any better. So you want to reduce, you want to reduce that. Okay, let's talk about incentives. I did touch on this earlier. Um, incentives are all right, okay? Who, who doesn't like getting paid? Um, <coughs> but this is, the, this is the ultimate question to, to any incentive. Um, does it help or does it hurt? Um, the case where the developers are getting told to do one thing and paid, and the operations guys are being told to do another thing and getting paid on the basis, is really hurtful. Um, so that means that you need to, to give them a common goal, right? So delivery is the ultimate goal. Yeah, right, good software, put it into production, it runs. Everyone has to be part of that. You all have to, you know, work together. And it's in the sysadmin's interest that the software doesn't have bugs. It's in the developer's interest that it's reliable and it can run consistently in production. So you should, you should reward, you know, based on, is the software out there? Are we making money? Are our customers happy? 
Um, and you should do it fairly. It's kind of really obvious to say you should reward people fairly. But what I mean here is that, you know, these people rewarded for quality, these people rewarded for quantity doesn't make sense, right? Everyone gets rewarded for quality. One of the one of the sort of the key things that come out of, comes out of um, XP is that you bake quality in, right? It's not something you add at the end of the process. It's something that everyone does while you're working on your product. Is it gets a little bit more. You know, a little bit better every single time someone touches it and improves it. So everyone's feeding into quality. So everyone should get rewarded for building a high quality product. And this is, um, you know, don't get gamed. The awesome thing about software developers and operations people is that they will game any system you put in front of them, right? <laughs> They're very clever people, um, because that's what the job is, right? The, the job of software development is here's a bounded system. Manipulate it within the rules of that system to do what you want it to do. If you give a bonus system to someone, they will find ways of maximizing their bonus. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that, that will have the positive effects that you're hoping it to. Um, the canonical example of this is a, a software development team where the developers were given like a bounty every time they fixed a bug, right? They were given like 50 pounds for every bug they fixed, which is nice, right? We all like fixing bugs, that sounds good. Except what happened was the developers being sensible, rational, good at the gaming systems people, they went to the QA team and said, every time you raise a bug that's really trivial, we'll pay you 25 pounds. <laughs> and so, so the number of bugs went through the roof, uh, and they were all, you know, trivial, please fix this typo sort of bugs, and they'd get fixed, and the developers would get paid, and they'd split the money with the QAs, and everyone was happy, um, except for the fact that the quality of the product didn't actually improve. Uh, nothing got better, uh, everyone got richer, and then the management realized that maybe they'd made a terrible mistake. So watch out for, like, any system that you make will get gamed, so you have to keep it, you know, simple and open and fair and honest and like really know what it is you're trying to, the behavior that you're trying to encourage with those, those incentives. So, celebrating. Celebrating is awesome, right? So who, who here has a, has a project or is on a project or works on a software project? Anyone? Okay, keep your hand up if occasionally you have like a release or something good happens on the project and you go out and celebrate. Hurrah! Okay, awesome, you don't need me to tell you this. Uh, it's nice, right? You go out and celebrate and um, you all feel better, you've done some good work um, and it's like, you know, you've, maybe you've worked you know, nights or you've gone really hard just to get, get the software out the door and then it's there and you know, that's great. But you have to be careful with this, right? You have to be inclusive. One of my, my earliest um, clients, I was working with the systems team and um, we had a development team and you know, we were working away, agile development, all working very nicely. Um, the first release came up, right? We've been going for three months. It was like a totally greenfield project. Three months going, we're doing little sort of QA releases, staging releases, and then like the big day of putting it live on, the, on a public website uh, came. And um, so the, the final iteration came around and the developers had done all their stories. I was like, hurrah, all the stories are done. We're going to the pub. And so all the development team went off to the pub. Which then meant that the systems team was left behind to pick up the, the final build from that iteration and put it into production. So their work was just starting as the developers was just finishing. And here we were doing, you know, quite risky stuff. You know, we were... We were bringing down a production web server, or in fact, 70 production web servers, to install this new software, put it public to a site that serves 200 million hits a day. So quite nervous, right? Meanwhile, everyone else was getting really drunk. And, and that sort of thing doesn't build a cohesive team, right? It says, I'm going to do my work, you're going to do your work, and like, we don't really talk to each other. You know, the right thing to do in that instance is you say, hurrah, we're done. Now we'll help the systems guys, right? Now we help the operations team. And then when they're done, we'll all go out drinking. So the thing is to be inclusive. You know, no one likes being left out of the party. Um, 
This is mostly pitched at a Western audience, but I would imagine a similar thing in India where quite a lot of people don't drink. Yeah? So, while it's nice to go to the pub on occasion, you don't have to do it every single time. Um, do something different. One of the best um, sort of after project celebrations I had, uh, we finished early, it was a sunny day, right? No drinking involved, we just all went out and enjoyed the sun. So kind of be, you know, have variety, do things that are inclusive. Um, again, no one likes being left out. And, you know, this sort of, the, the, the level at which we work, where we have experts in systems who we depend on, you know, everyone's an individual, and we need to look after those individuals and, you know, do things that they like. So, so make sure that when you do have celebrations, you're, you know, not everyone will like everything, but make sure you kind of cycle around lots of different activities to just let everyone, you know, let their hair down. And here's, this is, this is um, again, it's a little contentious. Um, Eric Rees in The Lean Startup describes businesses as um, learning machines and that the, the point in, in, in the startup is to learn about what your customer wants and learn about how you can deliver it. And this means that failure is a very important thing, right? Failing is good. We like failing because when we fail at something, we've learned about it and we've learned that what we did was not the right thing to have done, so we won't do it again, right? So, re recognizing and celebrating your failure is important. Yeah, it's okay if your money is not on the line. So, well, that's, that's the thing, right? Is, is by celebrating small failures and learning from them, you prevent big failures, yeah? Um, and so here's an example of that. This is the fail cake. Um, and this is an idea from a, a friend of mine who works in a and they have a rule where, as a system administrator, if you break the system in some horrible way, your, your punishment is to buy cake for the team. And this is awesome, right? Because it's a small punishment, right? It's not like you're being beaten up. It's, it's, it's small, so it's, it's not awful. Um, but it's still enough that you're going to be careful. Um, and then, you know, you bring the cake to everyone, and then you talk about what you did, right? And why things broke and what went wrong. So you kind of like have a little retrospective and everyone's eating cake, right? And it's really hard to get annoyed with someone who's just brought you some cake, yeah? <laughs> so so you, you kind of diffuse the, you know, the, the fear of the situation, the problem that this, this failure has caused. Um, so the, the fail cake is an awesome thing. And so I encourage you to sort of try other interesting ways of, you know, looking at your, you know, your project's failures and saying, well, how can, we, how can we learn from this? How can we retrospect? How can we improve the way we work? So, systems access. Um, this is something where I start to deviate from the way a lot of system administrators think. Um, everyone has read right to puppet, chef, configuration management. Um, I would go so far as to say everyone should have root on your servers. Uh, everyone. Production Yes. Developers should have root on your production servers. And here is why. Because if your production server gets hacked or broken in some way, you need to be able to rebuild it, right? Quickly and efficiently and sensibly. So you can assume that it's a hostile environment. So your developers can run code on your production servers, right? That's their job, is to write code that runs on your production servers. Functionally, they've got root already. They want to do something bad, they'll write code, put it in, it runs, yeah? What it means to say, you know, they can change things, is we are confident that we can fix our systems if they break, right? We're saying we trust the developers to do the right thing. Now, there's a whole load of other systems you have to have, or practices that you have to have to back that up, right? You might say, you know, we'll, we'll not let you have root, but a sysadmin can sit next to you and you can pair, and he'll log in as root, and you can do work together. Um, or you might say, we'll give you sudo for certain things. But, but the, the rule of, of thumb is, is that it's, it's um, you know, if you, if you just lock developers out of your, your production systems, you're just saying, these are our problem, anything before it is your problem. It's, it's a false risk mitigation. Um, but it comes with a, with a cost, right? And the cost is you have to share the pain. So if developers can log into production, that also means that when production breaks, 
developers fix it. Yeah? And so to, to say root is, is like, you know, root on the actual box is maybe overstating it for some cases. Certainly read right to Puppet, right? You can make changes to Puppet, you can check them in, everyone can see what, what you've done, and if we need to roll it back, then we can change your Puppet configs and roll it out, yeah? But that means if it breaks because of your change, you need to put it back. Um, you look at places like um, Etsy um, and Forward, like Fred talk about Forward um, on Friday, Developers just push straight to production, right? Commit a change into production. Not testing. Sorry? Not testing. Uh, well, they, they test to make themselves feel happy, right? So it's, so it's do a change. Do I need to test it? Yeah, if I'm comfortable. You know, am I just fixing a typo? As long as I'm comfortable, I push. And, and if it breaks, I fix it straight away. In fact, at, at Etsy, they're very strict about this, and they say if you commit to the repo, you have to push that change into production within 15 minutes or so. Because if you don't, then what happens is the next person comes along and wants to push their change, and they can't because they're backed up behind yours. So they're very strict about if it's good enough to go in the repository, it's good enough to go on production. Super fast. Yeah? Etsy. Uh, Etsy is a website. Uh, it's a little bit like eBay for handmade goods. So if I make something, I can have a little Etsy site, and you can go there and see what I've made, and you can buy it, and they take a percentage. Um, and they're doing very well. Um, Uh, yes? Sorry, can you speak up? What would be your suggestion to uh, how do you have shared systems when you're working with uh, banks? In banks? Yes. yes. So, so um, where, where data is a fair model. Yes. You just can't let developers have access. So, so the question is. Um, if you have a bank or a financial or some system with like regulatory requirements about user data, um, how do you deal with um, like access to those? The answer to that is um, you focus around delivery teams, not around the operations team. So a delivery team is a unit that writes code and delivers it into production. So the, the financial I was working at five years ago, their developers sat next to their traders. So the developers had access to the systems the traders were using with all of the live data in, and they would write code and deploy it, and then the traders would use it. Okay? So they've got access to production. Their, their name is developer, um, but they're, they're also the administrator of the production system. Right? The production system breaks, the developer fixes it. So that's how you look at that, is, is you, you try and get out of the, the mindset of the developer role and the sysadmin role, and you just say, here's the team, and they manage that product. But it is an interesting question. We can talk about it more later if you want to. So that's, that's, a, that's a great thing, right? How do you stop developers breaking your stuff? Yeah? Tests, right? As, as, uh, as developers, as agile people, right? Like we like tests because they prove stuff works. Do documents don't prove stuff works, tests do, right? So as, a, you know, as the guardian of, of the production database, I might say to my developer, have you run your query on the staging database? Did it take a sensible amount of time? Yeah? Have you got a test that proves that it that it works and that it's not going to go and delete a load of data. Um, things like Puppet Chef changes, there are tools, right? There's Cucumber Puppet, um, there's a Chef, Cucumber Chef-like tool, I can't remember the name of. Um, so you can write tests for these things and you can say, is it passing the tests? Have you done it in QA? Um, or you can do pairing, right? If you're going to run like a big query on a database, yeah, you should sit with a, a DBA first. Um, but the thing is, is, is that the, the access is shared. It's not my system. It's not, like, it's not operations owns production and you can't ever see into it, right? It's, it's our system. We all have to work on it. Um, so let's, you know, let's find good ways of doing that. And largely it's based around trust. A lot of the sort of gatekeeping type systems that exist, exist because there's not enough trust between operations people and development people, right? Occasionally you run a long running query that's horrid, 
most of the time you won't, and it means you'll go so much faster that you know you, you negate the, the problems of of breaking your database every so often. All right, I have to talk quite quickly now. Uh, information sharing systems are great for DevOps people. Um, this is a great example. This is um, a monitoring dashboard in an operations team. Um, and you can see these are the alerts that are coming in. And as the team clears out the alerts, they get more kittens. So uh, if you get all of the alerts cleared and the production data center is, uh, is fine, you get pictures of kittens, which is a wonderful motivator for, for systems teams. So developers need to see into production, right? I want to see that that change I've just put live has worked, right? And this is really useful stuff. So places like Etsy, where they're doing uh, continuous deployment, like every change goes straight into production, the developers will watch production metrics when they make the change. And you'll see if user traffic just goes like this, you've broken something. Yeah? So developers really need to see into production. Similarly, ops people need to see the new features, right? An awesome thing that, that we can do now is using Nagios or similar monitoring tools to drive development. So I can develop my feature, and while I'm developing it, I'll write a monitoring script that monitors that it works. And I can deliver the whole thing into operations and say, here is the new feature and the script that proves it works. And that's awesome for doing releases, right? Because I can put the monitor live, watch it fail, 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 do the new release, and then the monitor will start passing. And that way I know that all of the features for that application are working, not just the usual monitoring stuff of, you know, is it running? I can actually say, is it running and does it work? Uh, big visible displays, um, they look great. They make the investors feel like their money is being well spent. They're really impressive. Um, and they're useful, right? Information radiators that just kind of bleed information into the room. Yeah, is the build passing or failing? Uh, is the production website running a bit hot? Are we going to need to add capacity? All useful stuff because it gives you a feel over time for what the project is like. Um, Things like noises, right? Build noises that go off whenever a build passes. Really useful because they kind of give you that heartbeat of a project, right? You can hear every hour or so, you get a noise that says a build has passed. And when you start running this in a, in a team, you notice things like, well, when that noise stops being there, you notice and people start saying, well, why are builds not passing? What's broken? Where, where do we need to fix things? You know, if you're surrounded by a wall of red lights, you can be pretty sure something has gone wrong and it's more important than whatever it was you were doing before all of the lights went red. And DevOps people um, should all go to each other's meetings. Not every meeting necessarily, but enough to make sure that you understand what, uh, what's going on sort of with the other people, you know, what they're doing, what's going to come up soon that's going to affect you. Um, you know, the operations guy is going to change the base operating system you're running on. That's going to affect your development team. So you need to know about each other's work backlogs and sort of schedules for the, your upcoming work. All right. Okay, metrics are really useful. Um, there have been some other talks on metrics, so I'm not going to go into them in huge detail. Um, but these are, these are things that you need to ask yourself. You definitely need to have metrics to drive your system, to make decisions about it. So ask yourself, what happens at release time, right? Um, Netflix, when they do a release, they, they do uh, A-B testing, so they release their new code, they watch the site. If the amount of money coming in goes down, they roll back the release straight away, right? Which is really useful. They only release stuff that makes their, their site more, more valuable. Yeah, so how do you determine how long that window Practice. Yeah? Try it for a certain amount of time. It should be, you know, short enough that, that you're making decisions quickly enough, but long enough that you've got a representative sample of data. So the answer is, how many customers do you have? How rapidly do they visit the site? You know, how much money do they spend each time? Um, Try for a period, and if you're going too slowly, do less. If it's not enough information, do more. But you need to, you need to answer the basic question. Um, how can we measure it, right? 
there are two sc schools of thought on metrics, one of which is capture everything, and the other school of thought is just capture those things that you care about. Um, I tend to be sort of a bit in the middle, which is capture everything, but then only look at those things that you care about. It's no, there's no point in measuring server uptime, right? If you've got a web full of bajillions of servers, who cares about one server's uptime? It's totally irrelevant. Um, so don't even bother tracking it. But you do definitely care about site uptime, right? And probably more importantly, you, you care more specifically about different uptimes of different parts of the site, because you want it to degrade gracefully if something breaks. You don't want to just throw your toys out the pram. So you know you need to think about what, what metrics you're going to have. Um, and then you can use those to make proper decisions, right? Do we keep a release in or do we roll it back? Are we making more money? Then we'll keep it, right? There's hard evidence. It takes away a lot of the sort of wishy-washy defensive thinking that sort of occurs around organizational boundaries to do with risk, right? You can say, this definitely happened. It's an empirical observable fact. Therefore, this is the right way to do it. That, that's very valuable. And you should share the data around everyone, right? It's useful for developers to know how many hits does the site get, right? How do they need to scale up? Are you, if your site is performant, are you going to improve that by adding nodes to your pool or by improving the speed of the software by performance tuning it? You need to you know, work that out, and you can only do that by sharing the, the metrics data. All right. The final, the final tip for having uh, happy DevOps teams is change agentry. So in order to do a lot of this stuff, you need to make changes to the to the way people work, right? And that's difficult. So you need to employ change agents, people to go and make friends, stir things up, you know, break the boundaries, um, do, you know, ask those difficult questions. Say, is this really the right way to be behaving? Shouldn't we, you know, try something out? And the interesting question about, you know, these people is, are they an, an internal employee or an external consultant? There is no right or wrong answer for this, right? It depends on your organization. Is it better to have some proverbial skin in the game and feel the pain alongside everyone else? Or do you want someone who's external and you know, unburdened un, um, by you know, past history? So for those of you who are counting hard, you will see that the top tips actually went up to 11. Um, that is the end. Uh, I'm sorry for running us right to the end of time. If you do have further questions, I'm, I'm around all day. Grab me any time. I'm happy to talk. Uh, thank you very much for coming.